Charles again. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the fourth annual Evil Twin Debate brought to you by the Intellectual Property Institute here at the University of Richmond School of Law. Uh, I'm Jim Gibson. I'm the faculty here at the law school. Our Evil Twin deba Debate series is founded on the notion that uh, there are experts who are often at loggerheads on sort of the substance of an issue but remain friendly uh, on a personal level. Uh, and so we try to bring those folks together to, to air an issue on which they disagree but who can air their disagreement in, in a friendly way. Uh, it's sort of a, a serious in substance but lighthearted in tone. Our debate topic today is the Google Books Settlement, standing copyright on its head. Uh, as we're going to hear in more detail momentarily, uh, the Google Books Project is one of the most significant conflicts between uh, new networks technologies and copyright law that we've seen in many a year. Um, and the proposed settlement of that conflict, which has been hammered out uh, between various publishers and authors on the one hand and Google on the other hand, um, presents not only interesting issues of copyright law, but also of uh, civil procedure and class action law, remedies, antitrust, and so forth. Our evil twins today are, uh, to my left, uh, attorney and policy expert Jonathan Band of policybandwidth.com, and to my right, Professor James Gimmelman of New York Law School. So to get us off on the right lighthearted note, uh, I did away with the normal practice of asking each participant to send me their own bio and instead asked each to send me the other's bio. Um, and so uh, here are, are the, each of their bios according to the other. Here's Jonathan's bio of James Grimmelman. James Grimmelman is an associate professor at the New York Law School, a law school in New York. He studied computer science in college and worked as a computer programmer at Microsoft, so he is one of the few law professors writing about the law and the internet that actually understands the technology. He's worked with groups such as Creative Commons and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which means that he doesn't get invited to free screenings at the Motion Picture Association of America. He might be the only person on the planet who has read all the attachments to the Google Settlement Agreement, as well as every one of the hundreds of objections. He has described the settlement as elephantine, leading to complaints by elephants, PETA, and the GOP. All right, so here is uh, James on Jonathan. Jonathan Band spent two decades at Morriston Forrester before hanging up his own shingle at policybandwidth.com. Get it? Policy bandwidth? He has written numerous Supreme Court and appellate amicus briefs on behalf of the library and high technology groups, patiently explaining the dangers of overexpansive intellectual property law. That's pretty much his mission in life, patiently explaining things. Witness his 103-page, 937-footnote article, The Long and Winding Road to the Google Book Settlement, which incidentally is available uh, on the table outside for those of you with a abiding interest and strong backs, um, which is the definitive history of the Google Books lawsuit and settlement. A frequent speaker at, the li at library events and advocate for libraries in the policymaking process, Band may well be librarian's favorite lawyer. So here's how we're going to proceed. Uh, first, uh, James is going to do a five-minute uh, supposedly objective introduction of the topic. Uh, then Jonathan is going to present his argument uh, for 12 minutes. James is going to present his for 15, and then Jonathan is going to have three minutes for rebuttal. That should bring us to maybe 15 or 20 minutes uh, to 1 o'clock, at which point we'll have a Q&A. And after that's done, uh, we can go to the atrium to continue the conversation over some food and drink. So, with no further ado, I give you James Grimmelman. So, thank you to Jim and to all of you for having us here. And let me tell you a bit about the history of the project and the settlement. So, back about almost five years ago, over five years ago now, Google entered into partnership agreements with a number of university libraries to digitize essentially their entire collections, not counting duplicates and various few special things. Basically, Google would come to the library, bring up a big truck, take away lots of books, make digital copies of all of them, and repeat the process again and again. It's up to somewhere around 15 million books now. Uh, what Google does with these digital copies is it recognizes all the text in them, makes an index of the words and what pages they appear on, and then has a search engine uh, at books.google.com. You can just type in a phrase and see every page of every book it appears on. Well, actually, you can't quite see 
every page. What Google would do would be to show a short snippet of a couple of sentences before and after the book, after the phrase in that particular book, that particular page. Copyright owners, unsurprisingly to us, but perhaps surprisingly to Google, weren't thrilled with this ac action. And Google, after a few months, relented and let them fill out a form removing their books from the program. That wasn't enough. Uh, authors and publishers were upset that Google was doing this even if it hadn't heard from them. So they sued. The authors filed as a class action. And then the case disappeared into litigation for several years and came back in 2008 with the proposed settlement. The proposed settlement actually lets Google keep on doing everything it's been doing. It's released from past liability and can keep on scanning and indexing books. And what's more, it can offer new revenue models. It can show ads next to up to 20% of the books. It can sell digital copies online called consumer purchase. It can sell a subscription service to libraries and institutions where they can see every book in the catalog. It can offer a so-called research corpus for machines to do automatic research on the whole set of books. And more to be determined. In exchange, Google pays $60 for each book it's already scanned. And going forward, we'll pay 63% of the revenues, which will be split between authors and publishers. Google actually will cut the checks to a new institution called the Registry, or Books Rights Registry, which will be in charge of finding authors and publishers and giving them checks for their proportionate shares. If the author hasn't shown up to say, these are my books, the publisher hasn't shown up, the Registry will hang on to the funds for up to 10 years, using part of it to look for them. And after 10 years, that money goes to charity. This is the so-called unclaimed funds. The settlement lets copyright owners opt out. That is, they can say, don't display my book. I don't want you showing it to anybody. Uh, please do not put it in the revenue models. Obviously, if they opt out in that way, there's no money coming in, no checks for them. The settlement has been intensely controversial. The original opt-out deadline was supposed to be in May of 2009. Uh, about six months after the settlement was announced. A group of potential objectors asked the court for a delay, which was granted just because this whole thing, 140 pages plus, was so complex, they needed more time to work through it. Uh, that fall, there was a filing deadline for opt-outs and objections. Uh, several dozen heavily briefed objections were filed, including a statement of interest from the Department of Justice which said it had some little antitrust and class action concerns with the settlement. In response to this, Google and the authors and publishers took it off the table, asked for another month to renegotiate some details, and they came back with a revised version, which had a revised set of deadlines, so this all happened in January and February of this year. As it turned out, perhaps unsurprisingly, the changes didn't really satisfy anyone, uh, and so, the U.S. Department of Justice filed another statement of interest saying, we still have these various concerns. And the same usual crowd of suspects, some of Google's competitors like Microsoft and Yahoo, some public interest groups, uh, and a number of authors and publishers who didn't like the terms of the class action filed objections. There were also filings in support from various groups, the National Federation of the Blind, various other public interest groups, and individuals step forward to say, we think this thing is great. There was an all-day fair fairness hearing in February. Uh, and since then, the case has been completely quiet. We are waiting for the judge to issue a ruling. And in the meantime, we're debating whether this thing's a good idea or not. Jonathan? Thank you very much, James and, and Jim, for, uh, for hosting this event and for all of you for coming. Now, if I had to give that summary, it would have taken three times as long. So that's why uh, uh, James has the unique ability to uh, describe this, this, uh, this controversy in a very succinct and clear way. Um, I, I, I just kind of go into everything in more detail. Um, so the big issue, sort of what we're debating now, is what should the judge do? Should he approve the settlement or not? Again, as all of you know, under Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, if there is a class action settlement, uh, the settlement needs to be approved by the judge. And just to a uh, slight digression, the reason why 
you need to have the judge approve the settlement. Judges don't typically approve settlements, but why you need to have the judge approve the settlement with class actions is because the judge, the whole point is Congress felt there was a need to protect the members of the class from the class action lawyers. So the, the whole point of a class action settlement really is making sure that the class action settlement is fair, reasonable, and adequate to the members of the class because, again, historically, that's the class action lawyers have taken advantage of the process. You know, they file on behalf of the class, and then the settlement, usually the only people who make any money under the settlement are the class action lawyers. You know, they get $30 million, and you, as a member of the class, get a coupon uh, to buy something at, at, uh, at, at a future date. Um, so that's, so, 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 so really what we're talking about here now and what we're going to debate is should the judge approve the settlement? So, uh, and, and I think uh, with some hesitations and some reservations, the judge should approve the settlement. Um, when you're looking at the settlement, uh, it's certainly not perfect, but it's like everything else in life. You have to sort of say, well, you know, how is this or how do you evaluate this compared to something else? You can't, you can't just look at it in a vacuum, and you certainly can't compare it to some kind of uh, platonic ideal of a, of a digital library. You have to say, well, what is a, a reasonable alternative? What is an alternative that actually could be uh, brought to, to fruition? So you first have to say, okay, look, and, and there's two different things sort of on the table. You have the settlement, but then you also have the initial project, the initial scan and snippet display that Google was performing. So there's no question in my mind that if you sort of compare the, the, the scan and snippet display, the original library project, and that's actually, if you go to Google Books right now, that's what you see. You compare that to the status quo beforehand, status quo ante, then there's no question that, that having scanned into the snippet display, uh, having access to, having an index to all the books in the libraries in the, in, in the United States, all the research libraries, or the top research libraries, that's clearly better than uh, an index, that your, your, your current index, the current index of, of, uh, of the internet, which just has websites. I mean, obviously, we know that there are problems with websites, that their websites are not necessarily the most accurate and best information. You want to be able to have an access, an, an index to books. Uh, now, books have their own problems, obviously, but it's certainly um, uh, a, a richer uh, and, and more authoritative source of information than just websites. So if you compare snip, scan and snippet display to just the World Wide Web, obviously, that's, that's a step forward, to have the ability to an index to all the books. Uh, but as James indicated, uh, what the settlement does is, is go way beyond scan and snippet display. Under snippet display, under, the, again, the existing library project, you can just see, with respect to any search term for any book, what you'll see are uh, just the, 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 the first three times that search term appears in the book with a few sentences before and after. So you're seeing, you know, maybe a total of 15, 20 sentences from the entire book. So that's useful to find is the book relevant, but you can't really do much research with it. Under the, the, the settlement, what you would be able to do uh, is you would be able to see, first under the preview, you'd be able to see uh, up to 20% of the book. Now that's a whole lot better than being able to see just 15 sentences, let's say. And not only that, but it's free. It's a free service. Advertising, uh, ad, ad revenue would be uh, uh, funding it, but, but it would be free to the user. So that is an amazing research tool, when you think about it, that any user anywhere in the United States would be able to get access to basically see 20% of the books of all the top research libraries in the country. I mean, just, just think of what a, kind of an amazing research tool that would be. But then, as James mentioned, it gets better, okay? Just like, uh, you know, the, those ads on television, uh, you know, for, the, you know, for, the, for the, the slicing and dicing products. Uh, it gets better because you can have the consumer purchase. That would sort of be like 
uh, uh, you know, the Kindle or whatever, being able to access, get perpetual online access to a particular book. So let's say through the preview you were able to find uh, some, uh, 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 several good books that would be responsive to what you want, but you're able to find the exact book that you want. Um, now you can actually buy that book, you can buy perpetual access to that book, and, and that access, uh, uh, and, and, and you, you would, the, the pricing would be uh, set algorithmically, but at least initially about 80% of the books would be available for less than $10. So that's actually a pretty good deal, and a lot would be even would be, you know, it starts like from $2 and goes on up. So the books would be much less expensive than they would be under, under the Kindle right now. Uh, so, so then, but it gets better yet. Because if you're a student at a university, so let's say if you were here at, at the University of Richmond, if you're a student here, a faculty member, the institution presumably would get an institutional subscription uh, to the full text of all the books in the database. So again, you from sitting right now, here sitting here, or well, you wouldn't want to do it during this discussion, right? But afterwards, I mean, you could, you know, whether it's, you know, if you're sitting in a class or if you're sitting in the library or sitting in your apartment, you would be able to get full text access on your computer to the full database, which would be, presumably be uh, 15, uh, right now as James indicated, 15 million books and I think Google is ultimately hoping to get up to 30 million books. That's a lot of books. I mean, just again, think of it in terms of the enormous research benefits. Uh, but it gets better still because it would not only be available to, the, the, these, the, the services would all be screen reader enabled so that the visually disabled would be able to have access uh, to all that. I mean, so, so again, they would be able to have access to the sort of read aloud functions and other navigation tools for the, for all of these services. So again, uh, and right now the visually disabled have access to such a, a tiny, tiny sliver of books that this would really be radically transformative to them, which is why the association representing, the associations representing the visually disabled are so supportive of the settlement. So everyone thinks, or virtually everyone, thinks that the services provided under the settlement are terrific. So what's the problem? Well, as James indicated, the two problems are largely how this, these services were reached, i.e. it's through a class action settlement to a copyright lawsuit uh, rather, than, uh, uh, rather than legislation. And the other problem is who is providing the service, i.e. that it's just Google. This is a service only Google will be able to provide. It won't be a competitive service. So I'm already running out of time. Let me just talk a little bit about those issues and why I don't think they're that significant. So with respect to the class action settlement, I mean, you, people have been pointing out, well, there are notice problems and this really isn't an appropriate a, a class from uh, because the the a cla a class for a, a class action purposes because the 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 parties the members of the class are so diverse they have diverse interests uh, a, 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 an issue that was really important for the Justice Department was the the settlement sets up these forward looking licensing models all these commercial display models that we talked about the preview the consumer purchase the institutional subscription, which are far broader than the, uh, the original lawsuit, right? The original lawsuit was, was about the act of scanning and the snippet display, sort of displaying 15 sentences, right? A very narrow product, but what was, what, what, what the, 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 the settlement comes up with these much broader revenue models. And uh, so the Justice Department and others are saying, well, you, you can't do that. That's, you, can't, you can't take a, dis, a, a dis, dispute that involves this activity and come up with a settlement that involves this activity. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the people who were particularly upset about this whole class action mechanism were the French and German publishers and authors and the French and German governments each filed briefs in opposition to the settlement. And, and when uh, James discussed how there was an amended settlement, the, the, the basic change between the original settlement and the amended settlement was to cut out all of the foreign 
books, uh, all the books of the foreign rights holders except for the uh, British, uh, Australian, and Canadian authors. So their books are in, but all the other foreign books are out of the settlement. And that's still, you know, the, the French and the Germans still were upset about the settlement. Um, and I guess I, there's no question that this is sort of a broad and bold usage of, of the class action mechanism. But my attitude is, so what? I mean, I don't see why legislation is inherently more legitimate than, uh, uh, than a class action. Um, then, just in the, the one minute I have left, is the, the, the other question, or the other concern, is that only Google is allowed to provide this service. Because it's a class action settlement, Google was the only defendant. Uh, so Google is the only uh, party able to provide the service. Um, now, but that's not quite right, because uh, the, the way it's all going, uh, the, uh, part of the deal was that, that, that Google, when Google takes a book out from a library to, to scan it, it keeps a copy of the digital scan for its database, its search database, but the library gets a copy back. And so the libraries now have pooled together all their copies, and they have, in essence, a huge database also of all these books. So they have, the, it's called the Hatik Trust, and right now there's a database that's run by the libraries of, with 15 million books. Now what they're able to do with it right now is pretty limited, but there is this alternate database out there. Um, and, but, but, but the notion that somehow uh, we need to have more competition and, and just having Google provide the service sort of runs opposite to the, a lot of the concerns in the class action, meaning that in the class action settlement, uh, uh, with the, 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 the concerns about having a class action settlement are that somehow it's unfair to all the rights holders that there are, the rights are being uh, determined in this manner without their input. Um, but then if you're going to say, well, we need to have a, a solution that allows not only Google to trample on their rights, but allows Microsoft and Yahoo and Amazon to trample on their rights, how, does that, how is that better? And, and you can see that at, at the end of the day, this, the, the concerns between the, using a class, the class and action mechanism to settle this, as a, to resolve this, as opposed to legislation, or um, but the concerns about that as opposed to the competitive concerns with respect to Google, those are, those, those concerns are in tension with one another, right? That if you, if you, if you, if you're worried that this isn't fair to, to rights holders, how could it possibly be fair to allow more rights, more service providers use these books and provide access to the books? And, and the final point also in terms of, you know, kind of, even if you do say that this does give Google an advantage, uh, somehow a competitive advantage over the, the competitors, two, two related points. One is that, Microsoft and Yahoo, in fact, did start to provide uh, uh, this kind of service. They did start scanning books, uh, but they dropped out because they didn't think it was a viable market. So if they didn't think it was a viable market five years ago, why should we care about the fact that now Google is going to continue moving in this direction? The, the second point, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll stop with this, is in the end, in the final analysis, the number of, even though we're talking about a lot of books, okay, maybe 30 million books, these are the 30 million books that are in copyright but out of print, right? So, so it's a lot of books, but this is, there's a reason why these books are all out of print. These are older books, they're not of, they're more academic books. We're not talking about Scott Turow, right? You know, that, those books are in print, uh, and are, are, are really not, are, are not covered by the settlement in, in the same way. And so uh, in that market, sort of the, if you sort of look at the number of books sold and the, what, what goes on in the future, I mean, the, for, the, for the market for in-print books, Google, uh, Amazon rather, is by far the largest player, has a huge market share. And in terms of, you sort of say, sort of looking forward five years uh, or 10 years, Say, how many books are going to be sold through the Google Books, uh, under the Google Books settlement? Again, a, you know, a lot of titles, but we're basically talking about these out of print books. As opposed to how many books is Amazon going to be sending through the Kindle? The number, Amazon, I would not, I would not be surprised if Amazon will, every year will sell 10 times as many books or 100 times as many books as Google will. 
through these services. And so at the end of the day, it's all sort of very intellectually interesting, but in terms of the impact on the book marketplace generally, it, it really is not that significant. And with that, I'll sit down. Thank you very much. So I have to say that I agree with everything Jonathan has said, in particular the role of the settlement in making more books more accessible is something that I really want. I like books. I want to have access to all of these books that are really hard to track down right now. In my research, I'm all the time coming across books where the only copy that I can find is $80 or more uh, used. And the library says, we can't find anyone else who has that for interlibrary loan who let us have it. Uh, so I want these books, and I think it will be transformational for society to have them. But having said that, I'm concerned about how we get there. And I have to say, I also agree with Jonathan when he says this settlement is not perfect. I maybe I'd emphasize that a little bit more. Um, I want to focus on one particular set of books, the ones whose owners can't be found. We, this is referred to in copyright as the orphan works problem. There are some copyright owners, now that copyright lasts for life of the author plus 70 years, the owner simply can't be identified or contacted by someone who wants to make use of the book. You can find the author who has been dead for 30 years and you don't know which of their descendants owns the copyright. The publisher has been swallowed up in a series of corporate mergers and nobody's records are good anymore. You just can't find the copyright owner. And the orphan works, therefore, sit in this limbo because if you can't find the owner, you can't actually start printing new copies for this fear that they will actually pop up someday and sue you for massive damages. Now, this is a recognized problem in the copyright system, and there have been legislative attempts to fix it, though so far haven't gone anywhere, which I guess leads to some support to Jonathan's theory that the alternative isn't very good either. But Nonetheless, if you're serious about the idea that there's an orphan works problem, if you think that we're never going to be able to track down these owners, then arguably you think these books ought to be in the public domain instead. And that would mean that they were free for anybody to use and freely available to the public. That just cut, get rid of the legal obstacle entirely. And that's not what the settlement does. The settlement instead sets up Google in a special role, collecting money for the use of these books. And in a very important sense, the settlement winds up being exclusive. The settlement doesn't prohibit copyright owners from striking whatever deals they want with anyone. If your book is being sold through this, you could also cut a deal with Amazon to sell it through the Kindle. The libraries will also have those digital copies. But for orphan works, the ones where the copyright owners can't be found to get permission currently, they won't be findable after the settlement either, which means that they'll never show up to claim their money. It will just pull up going to Google and ultimately through the registry out to charities. And while the books will be available for sale on Google, no Amazon, no publisher, no one else could find the owner to get the rights to print competing copies. And those digital copies that the libraries and the Hathi Trust have, they'll be sitting there too. The libraries can't actually start showing you the full text of the books because that would almost certainly be copyright infringement. So there will be more digital copies around than there were before, and there'll be more access to books than there was before, but it will all, for these orphan books, be going through Google. And we should worry about the consequences of channeling so much through one company. You know, copyright has, I think, a very nice history of decentralization. Yes, the author gets exclusive rights to control the copying and distribution of their book, but it's not like there is one central institution, like the old Stationers Guild before the modern copyright system, that actually controls it all. No. Any of us who put pen to paper can be authors and acquire those exclusive rights, which means that copyrights are broadly distributed through society. They are created by many, many people, owned by lots of different people, distributed through a wide variety of channels and different media. There are thousands and thousands of publishers in the US. Uh, and with the rise of the internet and self-publishing, 
and even more channels opening up. This is a very broadly decentralized system. It supports, to use an overworn metaphor, marketplace and ideas. And the settlement, in some sense, creates something that looks a little more like a monopoly in ideas to the extent that thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of books will be funneled exclusively through this one source. And centralization creates its own special, complex set of problems. Take, for example, the privacy objections that various groups like the Electronic Privacy Information Center and various privacy-concerned authors have made to the settlement. They're concerned that if you buy an online ebook through the settlement, Google can track not just which books you've bought access to, but how you read them page by page. This is necessary in order to make the auditing and the billing work. Well, with that, it gives Google a level of knowledge about people's reading habits that no library, no bookstore has ever had. And libraries, and to a lesser extent, bookstores, have been very active in fighting for reader privacy. Uh, there are library patron privacy laws in every state, and bookstores have been often been active in litigating the right to keep secret who has bought what, because it touches on core First Amendment concerns. Now, Google has said, we will have a generous privacy policy. We promise to be good about this, but it's not a legally enforceable promise, and they haven't actually unveiled the privacy policy itself under which all of this would operate. Now, this may be one thing when it's a few books, books voluntarily shelled through one source. But when it's hundreds of thousands of books, and that is the only source for many of them, that raises pretty significant privacy concerns. The centralization exacerbates that worry. And similarly, a lot of libraries are very concerned about the pricing of the institutional subscription. This will be this blanket access to these millions of titles. Well, the University of Richmond would certainly love to have that for students and faculty. And I think at some point they're simply going to demand it, that if they can't provide it, competing institutions will attract students and faculty instead. This becomes a must-have item for every university, for many libraries. And with that, that creates a lot of upward pressure on the price. The settlement says that we priced with reference to comparable items. But there's nothing comparable to a database of every book. This is a wholly new, wonderful, unprecedented thing. But at the same time, it raises concerns about what some have called price gouging, others might call monopoly pricing, which brings us, of course, to antitrust. The settlement raises non-trivial antitrust issues in at least two different ways. One of them is that because Google is now selling books that's acquired that have all these different copyright owners. Well, Google has to have some price to set the books at. Now, one option is the copyright owner says, set my book at $9.99. That's, I think, okay. But it's a little more worrisome when you don't have a price set by a copyright owner, when they've just been silent. And the settlement actually says that if the owner hasn't told Google what price to set, Google will set a price for them. So we've got one institution, that has been collectively delegated pricing responsibility by thousands and millions of competitors. So competitors getting together to pool all their rights to one institution that sets prices collectively on behalf of all of them. This sounds dangerously like a cartel for e-publishing. Now, there are lots of reasons to think that it might be harmless in practice, that the algorithm Google is told to use is supposed to maximize revenue for each individual rights holder rather than doing cartel pricing and jacking up the prices for everyone at once. There are other possible sources for many of these books. There are reasons to think that it may not lead to that result. Nonetheless, there's a serious antitrust issue here that requires seriously being thought through, and it's not necessarily clear that the settlement gets this right in every detail. There is a possibility that the government might need to come back in a few years down the road and say, whoops, this thing is monopolizing electronic books for many of these out-of-print, unavailable books. Perhaps more fundamentally from an antitrust perspective, you have here now one district judge 
who has the power by signing a piece of paper to create a powerful concentrated player in a market depending upon how you define it if this is the market for out of print books then arguably you can create a dominant player in that market it's a little unusual <coughs> to see the court system being used not to break up monopoly power but to create it so I think we should be very concerned about the judicial process that is used to concentrate power like that that is we should be paying very close attention to the class action issues raised by the settlement and I agree with Jonathan again here this is a boundary stretching use of a class action I would in fact go further and say it is unprecedented there are simply no clear precedents that address a settlement that operates in this way either for or against it so we have to stitch together our thoughts about how to think about it from bits and pieces all around class action law here's the way I'd characterize it this settlement is profoundly forward-looking a lot of your examples of class actions are essentially backwards looking the defendant released a toxic chemical into a lake and people who live nearby it are complaining they've been poisoned the defendant uh, fixed the prices of wheat futures uh, in the Northeast and people who paid excessive prices for wheat futures think that they've been defrauded there's a securities issue that happened and people have been hurt by it the employer is discriminating on the basis of pregnancy status and people want it to stop these are all directed to making the defendant pay for or stop doing something it has been doing in the past in contrast the settlement by talking about full books rather than just the scanning and searching Google had been doing before is directed to letting the defendant start doing something it has never tried to do in the past so Google here would enter the book market selling full text of books if it didn't have a settlement allowing it to do this that would be blatant copyright infringement and it would get shut down like that so this is actually a big rights transfer from the class to Google almost the opposite of the direction you expect things to flow in a class action settlement this kind of shaping future conduct through settlement isn't inherently illegitimate I mean courts have to deal with forward prep with remedies in one-on-one -on -one litigation but when you get into a class action this starts to look an awful lot like legislation you're affecting the rights of millions of people offer them in very divergent circumstances going forward that kind of prospective shaping of the copyright system is what Congress is supposed to do now Congress has not exactly been very good on copyright matters and I'm not terribly optimistic that this matter gets kicked over to them that they will do better than this nonetheless to quote the professor Pamela Samuelson on the settlement just because one branch of government is broken don't go breaking another and I want to leave you with another possible settlement that I think shows the dangers that are possible if you break down the implicit barrier against this kind of forward-looking settlement imagine that it's five years ago and BP has been setting up some oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico doing offshore drilling and one of them has a minor accident and you know a few hundred gallons of oil get dumped into the Gulf class action lawyers are quick on the scene a few of them file a lawsuit on behalf of all residents of the Gulf states against this oil spill and demanding compensation and they sit down in the negotiating room and after a while they sort of work things out they come to an arrangement it's like we don't want to do this piecemeal lawsuit by lawsuit filing instead we're going to work out a compensation scheme once and for all BP will set up a guaranteed fund to pay anyone damaged by future oil spills in the Gulf and you will have a you know, system that will be a fast payment very little proof of uh, harm of, of fault it will be accelerated payments this will be great people will know that they're safe from our drilling in the future and to make absolutely sure this you know people say so we'll release BP from customary liability we'll just soothe go to this compensation fund instead and BP says yeah and to make sure that the settlement is absolutely adequate the settlement will be filled with 500 million dollars 
That's got to be enough to pay for any possible damage. What could possibly go wrong? And then, settlement signed, approved. We've reshaped oil spill liability law going forward, and then we get to this past year, and you see exactly what can go wrong when this kind of legislative function is carried out by a court in the form of a class action settlement. I don't quite know what else the class action lawyers will do if we give them this tool, but I don't think that I want access to the books badly enough to give them that weapon. Jonathan? Uh, well, I agree with a lot of what James said. Um, certainly, I agree that the, the price issue is a significant problem. Uh, and so the, the question is, is, what's the best way to deal with that? And we do have precedents. Uh, uh, you, there is, uh, in both uh, ASCAP and BMI, uh, are both uh, subject to the continuing jurisdiction of uh, the Southern District, the court for the... Southern District of New York, there had been antitrust actions brought against both of them, and then there was a consent decree uh, with the Justice Department, and, and subject to that there, is a, there are price courts, where the court has continuing jurisdiction over ASCAP and BMI, and uh, they're able to regulate the prices uh, of ASCAP and BMI. And I would think that, that there's and this is the position that my library clients took with respect to the settlement, saying that the court should have continuing jurisdiction uh, over the, the pricing issues, particularly with respect to uh, the institutional subscription, uh, where, you know, that's where I think the money is, and so I think that that's where uh, you really need to have the court keep an eye on it and make sure that the, 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 the price gouging does not occur. With respect to uh, the, the, the colorful example James gave of, the, uh, uh, of, of BP and sort of the bigger issue of the settlement, uh, I, I must say that the, we need to remember that this settlement, even though it's forward-looking to some extent, it's backwards-looking too, i.e., it, apl it applies to a very set universe of books, meaning it only applies to books published before January 9th 2009, or January 5th, 2009. And it's trying to deal with a one-time legacy problem of these orphan works that James talked about. Uh, it's not, so, so, so it's not, the, the corpus is not going to get any bigger, it's talking about that one set of books. So in other words, it's like going to the BP analogy, it's really talking about oil spills that occurred before the date of the settlement. It's not a talking about settlement oil spills that would occur in the future. We know exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about this set of books and this set of uses with respect to that, this set of books. Um, finally, and, and again, I just want to close on this, is um, uh, that, uh, uh, again, in a perfect world, I would think that you would want to have Congress uh, appropriate $1 billion dollars to a consortium of libraries run by uh, of research, college, university research libraries and the Library of Congress to do this project. Okay, how many of you think that that's ever going to happen? And uh, I, don't, I don't think that, that uh, for example, your congressman here uh, in, 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 uh, in Richmond is going to allow the appropriation of a billion dollars to this kind of project, not, not in this environment, and I don't think in any environment. Moreover, uh, I, you know, a, any kind of legislation, the notion that somehow the legislation would be better for one party or another, the point is, this has been, uh, this settlement is controversial, it's been attacked from all directions as being too favorable to one side or too, favor I mean, too favorable to another side. The notion that Congress would ever be able to come up with an agreement, and if it could come up with an agreement, that it would be any better or any, the point is better in terms from whose perspective? More favorable from what perspective? Which interest uh, would, should it be more favorable to? And at, at the end of the day, uh, there's no question. Uh, copy, uh, 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 class actions are a legal fiction. It's a mechanism to get to a result. And class action settlements are a legal fiction. 
But copyright is a legal fiction too. And the rights we're talking about at the end of the day are not the kinds of rights that we really worry about in class action situations, you know, where you have, as, you know, the, as James started with, you know, a toxic spill that affects people's lives and you need, or the asbestos situation. And they've been able to come up with settlements there where you're talking about people's lives, you're talking about making sure they get health care protections, you know, hundreds of thousands or, or millions of dollars of protections per each, for each person into the future. Here we're talking about the economic rights relating to an out-of-print book, a book where the author has been receiving no revenue. And so the, here, at worst, they're going to get some revenue when they haven't been getting even, any revenue. And so at the end of the day, I, I think that this is a situation where the public benefit vastly outweighs any potential harm uh, uh, to the rights holders. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we have a few minutes left for questions, so if you have questions, you can come up to the microphone there, or I can come fetch you, or just give me a friendly wave. Anyone? Because I certainly have some. Well, I'll start off. Um, when the Google Books project was first launched, there were some starry-eyed academics like me that said, oh, great, Google is finally going to sort of take up the copyright banner and, you know, charge, finally we have this sort of uh, deep pockets iconoclastic plaintiff uh, that won't run away in fear when the copyright owners uh, start filing suit and, and will stand up and fight. Um, so I guess one way where you could get to the world that everyone thinks is a better world, where we have this sort of database available to the public, uh, is for the case to proceed to an actual substantive judgment rather than settle and for Google to essentially win a fair use argument, at least with regard to the sort of original snippet display plan they had. Is there any chance whatsoever that this is not going to settle, do you think? And if it doesn't settle, do you think there's any chance that there would be that sort of substantive judgment ever reached? That's for either or both of you. Well, let me just start with that. I mean, it's important to recognize that now that the settlement is half the size, meaning half the books, all the foreign books are out of the settlement. But Google is still scanning them and still doing the snippet display. So if there is going to be, so there is the, po the potential for litigation with respect to those, those books and, and a fair use vindication with respect to those books. Of course, it's also possible if there is litigation with respect to those books, uh, Google could lose. Uh, and and you know, maybe it would be a lot worse off if, if, the, if, a, if a court in that instance found that there was no fair use than with the settlement. And I think even if Google were to win on the fair use claim for its scanning and indexing, that only gets us the card catalog to this universal library. It tells us what's in the books. It doesn't actually get us full access to all of these out of print but in copyright books. Other questions? Chris? It's always us to have questions. One, kind of another angle in some ways off of Jim's question, what do you see as the potential for, for this kind of, I guess, activity in the sense of I, engage, I want to engage in, I need to engage in mass infringement really quickly against multiple parties to basically force kind of mass licensing. So, so Google does this and says, okay, well, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab every CD on the shelf, put it in there, put it up, I've now got this mass amount of infringement, they sue me, and this gets them to the table, and maybe I only do this for out-of-print works or works that are only on, uh, um, you know, uh, records or something like that, right? Or I do this for out-of-print movies now is my, my, my next, because uh, I want to at least maybe take an angle where it's not those that are, that are out there. I mean, is this, because it seems like that would be the next kind of, kind of over-the-horizon avenue would be to kind of engage in this activity for other types of media and maybe a, a settlement in this case sets a precedent um, that that's what's going to happen in these other cases. Or are these different? Are these different types of situations for either of you guys? I think it's very possible that somebody could try that. I just want to point out how incredibly risky a route it is. Uh, I believe a company called Napster figured it would bring the <laughs> record companies to the negotiating table, and instead they simply crushed it. And I think that that's right, that, that uh, again, what Google was doing was with what it felt 
in, in the original project, it was it thought it was staying within the bounds of fair use. Uh, we can debate whether they, that, w that was right or not, but that was certainly Google's view, that it was engaged in lawful conduct. Um, and then my understanding it was the authors and publishers, uh, once they started settlement negotiations over that initial the scan and snippet display, that it was the publishers and the authors who said, you know what, let's see if we can come up with something better. Because sort of scan, a settlement of scan and snippet display was, you know, relatively easy. It's just a matter of, you know, coming up with some kind of license, some kind of model, or some kind of, you know, so, so figuring out how much uh, Google would pay. Uh, and, but but the, 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 the forward looking was much more complex, but it wasn't, again, my understanding wasn't Google's idea, it was the publisher's idea. Uh, and then they were able to sort of take advantage of this class action settlement mechanism to get to where they wanted to go. But given that that's where the parties want to go, I'm, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. It's, it's an interesting mechanism to reduce transaction co costs. For, for Google to have on the front end started to say, look, we're going to go search for all these individuals, et cetera, it was easier to say, look, I, I'm going to send now and ask for forgiveness later right, in, in some ways, yeah. right, and it, maybe I have a reason to say I'm not sitting because it's fair use, but let's say even though I am, I really would like to make transactions with all these individuals, but this is a really nice mechanism for me to do that at a lower cost, um, and so it, it does seem like it would edge into saying, well, if I can do it in this area, maybe I can do it for, you know, all those movies that are out of print that I can't, in some ways the orphan work situation. Right, right, but, but, but to some extent that's, if you sort of look at it from Google's perspective, that's already been its, its basic business model, meaning it scans the World Wide Web, right? I mean, the, it, it crawls the World Wide Web all the time. That's how it indexes uh, all these websites. It's copying the World Wide Web into its search database all the time. Uh, and it doesn't get anyone's permission to do that. It just does it and then sort of relies on two mechanisms. One is that, is that uh, uh, a website that doesn't want to be crawled by a search engine can use a little bit of software, uh, uh, a, a header, an exclusion header that says, please don't uh, crawl my website, and then they respect that. Um, or a person can just say, well, take me out of the database, and, and, and sort of an opt-out kind of situation. But the bottom line is, is that the Google, to some extent already, that's how they operate now. Right. Uh, and so it, it, for them, it was not a big leap to go from the, the web environment where you're just crawling and not, without permi asking permission and in essence relying on fair use or an implied license to this, to this model. Uh, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to call it there. I know some students have, have one o'clock classes, so uh, thanks once again to Jonathan and James. And please join us outside in the atrium for uh, some food and drink. Thank you. <laughs>